is the one that says there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that comes to repentance. It didn't say the angels rejoice. It says there's joy in the presence of angels. And uh, I can always see my mom singing that song where she says that, uh, she says, when, when the angels hear me sing that song, they'll fold their wings because angels never felt the joy that my salvation brings. That's a great song. I love that. I'll have to sing that sometime. But anyway. All right. Um, well, uh, let's go ahead and take up our offering. We'll uh, have our, our ushers come up here. And you guys, remember our new uh, our new way of doing it, right? Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. So let's go ahead and we'll pray and ask God's blessing on the offering. And you be sure to give with a heart of thanksgiving. The Lord will bless you for that. Harris, come on to leave some prayer, buddy. Father well, Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this offering, Lord. And Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would be with Dad, Lord, as he preaches the message of legacy, Lord. And be with him, Lord, give him the words, Lord, in your name. Amen. to 
boy, something happened while he was singing, and I just, I was, I was looking at that cross behind him, and I was just watching, and it's just almost like, almost like Jesus saying, I did this for you, you know, it's awesome, I love that, amen. All right, well, young people, quietly, let Marion get to the back first, all right, you're doing great. There she goes with, with that Dale Earnhardt sign again. <laughs> <laughs> I never could understand that. <laughs> the way why did she do with that? But anyway, so I'll have to explain it to you later. What does it mean? Something about feet somewhere in mouth, but it doesn't work at my house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, do you know what it means? Yeah, it, it, it means. Uh, yeah, um, it needs to be quiet and follow and wait for her to get to the door, I think. Okay, apparently. all right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a code. All right. Well, today we're going to see uh, that certain seeds sown in the timeline of our journey uh, through life may not show up immediately, but they can turn out to be quite invasive. People like Aaron know what invasive means, all right? Uh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, well you, work, you work in the garden, man. You know what it is. And how many does? How many are not exactly sure what invasive would be? Okay, that basically means that, that uh, you basically get a weed that just starts to cover everything. That's that's invasive. Uh, sometimes you got invasive creatures. All right, like a, a snakehead. You know, they say if you catch a snakehead while you're fishing, to kill it because that thing will destroy everything that's in that pond or river or whatever it's in. But uh, but sometimes decisions that we make can be very invasive. Uh, this story is really a powerful demonstration of the verse that says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There are times when we are tempted to blame others for our decisions, uh, our, uh, or perhaps even uh, to have unhealthy expectations from others because of our decisions. Um, and we need to be aware of this as well. Just because we made bad decisions doesn't mean that others have to pay for them. You know, that's, that's very true. Uh, in fact, it's wrong for us to even expect for that to happen. But it tends to happen, though. And, uh, you know, again, this is, we're running through Genesis here. And uh, just, we're covering all the bases. But bad decisions cause us to look on others with envy. That can happen. Bad decisions cause us to have such regrets as we desire to take joy from others that we feel belongs to us. It, bring, it breeds covetousness. And uh, I want to just say, this is not a hopeless message, what I'm preaching here. Uh, I'm getting perhaps the worst part of that message over with right now, uh, so I can get to the good stuff. But to take our bad life, or, or, think, or events that are unfortunate in our life, uh, our bad decisions out on others who have it better than us, because they made good decisions, has no grounds to be justified. But it does happen. It happens everywhere we go. And, uh, you know, the, the question is why? And here's why. Because there is a refusal to accept the origin of consequential events that took place in our life as our own. It, there, there really does. It's something that we don't, that we fail to do at times. Um, as humans, we don't make mistakes, do we? <laughs> right? You know, God knows that we make mistakes. He knows that we're, he knows that we're, he knows our frame. He knows that we're but dust. Yeah. And there's a key to his help in the midst of our failures at times. Uh, but, you know, to say that we don't make any mistakes is an absurd comment. It really is. Um, but it's really what we believe in most cases, isn't it? We're going to witness this in our story today. The consequences of deciding to go to Egypt have been quite invasive in Abram's story. Um, so what are some of the decisions that were bad? What are some things that Abram did that he might easily have overlooked? And I want to use this message first of all, but not last of all, to help you to analyze how you got to the place that you're at right now. It's good for all of us to do this, but we need to analyze the situation at hand. Some of us are asking, why? Why did I end up here? How did I end up here? It's good to analyze how. Um, you know, that there, I, I've met people everywhere as a pastor. I've heard people ask, how could I have ended up here? 
And I tell them, what we need to analyze, first of all, how did you get here? And you need to be honest with yourself and before the Lord. And then we need to understand something that will help us. Once we have put down our pride, we will find comfort and guidance in the arms of the Lord. Always. Yes. He loves humility. But we must let go of our pride. We have to stop saying, but I'm the victim. Mm -hmm. we, we do. And start admitting, I've, I've made some bad decisions. Um, and this thought might anger some people. It does. It happens all the time. But it is a very, it's the very first thing to humbling ourselves in God's sight in order to receive help from Him to cure us of those invasive circumstances, those consequences that come in our life. The life of Abram is to help you to analyze your own story. And as uh, my wife had mentioned in the ladies' meeting, God sometimes leaves gaps in the story so that we can fill in those gaps with our own life. Um, so let's look at our text for today, Genesis chapter 16, okay? And I'll have you turn there, uh, Genesis 16, first book of the Bible, all right? So we'll look at verse 1 here, and uh, we'll breeze through this chapter, actually. We'll actually, we'll, I'll, I'll, be used, I'll, I'll be preaching from this chapter this Sunday and next Sunday, and then we'll be done with chapter 16. Um, verse 1 says, Now Sarai... Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Boy, that sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, so we'll stop there because the next verse is an entirely different message. Oh, but did you notice the language of this angel of the Lord? I will multiply thy seed. So you know that this is, we're talking about Christ pre-incarnate. And he shows up very frequently amongst the patriarchs in the Bible. Um, but um, have you ever considered this? The first bad decision that Abram made was before he even left Haran. Wasn't Egypt, wasn't Hagar, wasn't any of these decisions. He took Lot yes. with him. That was the first bad decision that he made. Um, why was this a bad decision? Well, you definitely see that it wasn't the best decision, do you? Um, but back in Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. He said, Get away from your family. Get away from all of them. Why? Well, what, what God had planned for Abram would mean that there could be no interference with other gods. Uh, his family were pagans. They worshipped the moon god. Uh, and uh, so they, you know, they, he didn't want any of that. Abram didn't have to go. He did have a choice. It was entirely up to him. He would have missed the blessings of God, of course. But God wasn't going to force him to do anything. But he went. Praise God for that. I'm so glad that Abram decided I'm going to go. And he took what to him 
was the best of his family. Lot was a saved man, and we see that, and the Bible calls him just Lot. He was the best of the family. You know, well, I can't leave Lot behind. I promised my brother that I'd take care of him. You know, his brother had passed away, and that's why he took care of Lot. Um, but Lot clearly was old enough to make decisions of his own. He was a man. He had his own flocks, the Bible says. Um, you know, he could have made his way in the world, but Abram took him. But you see, God said, get away. Get away from your kindred. Get away from everybody. Uh, not get away from the majority of them. You can take some of them with you. He said, get away from all of them. And many times when we take the best of what we are to forsake, mm. all right, uh, it creates invasive circumstances. You know, uh, when they brought kudzu from, I think, Vietnam, they, they, had, they, they thought this is a good plan. <laughs> it's not so good anymore. All right? Um, when it comes to our own lives, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, and, you know, sincerely and honestly, how did I really get to the place that I am right now? And look back as far as you possibly can. And we have to be honest with ourselves. Did you know that you can lie to your conscience so much that you actually start to believe it? Yes. Um, you know, you can convince your conscience so much that the consequences were not as they really truly were. You can actually formulate your own story of what had happened. Um, that you, can, you, you actually can convince yourself of your own lie. It's true. Uh, I think Satan, full well knowing that every single prophecy in Scripture has prevailed, full well knowing that the remaining prophecies declare his destruction, still believes that somehow he's going to win. Somehow, I, I think he really believes that he can win at the end of the, at the, end of the day. The, the prophecies themselves declare that he believes this. Uh, and yet he's still good to... You know, you would imagine reading a prophecy that says that you're going to believe your own lie and you still keep believing your own lie. That is amazing. I mean, he is a lie incarnate. Um, you know, our, our flesh, our flesh convinces ourselves that we are the victims of someone else's wrongdoing when in fact we are victims of our own choices sometimes. Mm. Now, I'm not saying all the time, all right? I'm not saying all the time, but a lot of times we can be victims of our own choices we got to stop blaming people around us. Mm -hmm. Oh, this was the case with Abram. You see, if you don't analyze the situation carefully, you'll start blaming Lot for giving Abram so much trouble. And you look at all the things that had happened. You might even be tempted to believe that Lot might have been the one to convince Abram to go into Egypt. But the fact remains, God said, get thee. Thee. All right, that is a singular pronoun. You, Abram, only, you get away from Haran. Leave your kindred behind, but it's in our nature to take something along with us, right? You know, something that mom and dad justified, a style of music that isn't necessarily harmful to you, but does something to bring you, you know, that, you know it's, or I, I should have said, it's nothing that will bring you closer to the Lord, but yet you justify it, all right? Um, the world is Haran. That's, that's what the world is. And God says, get away from Haran. Um, those seemingly harmless habits that we have, you know, the kind of music that we listen to. Look, I'll tell you, I have to guard what I listen to. As your pastor, I have to guard what I listen to. I find myself liking things that draw me towards the world, and I have to say, stop, Mike. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things available. Now you've got YouTube music where you can listen to just, uh, just about anything you want to and not have to pay a dime for it. It's all out there, all available to us. And God said to get away. You know, you're, you're a, a cussing habit. Uh, the kinds of things that you watch. The things that you'd never tell me you have a problem with. And as strange as it is, while you're with me, you don't seem to have a problem with it at all. But yet, you, you, you know, I heard somebody say that was, that was here, and I'm not going to name names, but they said, I have a cussing habit, and it blew my mind because I knew them for years, and I'm like, I've never heard you say a cuss word in my life. And they said, well, I do have a cussing habit. Well, how is it that they're able to control it in front of me? It's really unusual, you know. You're able to abstain from uh, something as long as you're in places where the, 
where that practice condemns you the most. But, you know, the thing is, is, is the more you're there, the more your flesh is not able to keep trying to put up that false front. That's really what it is. Well, I just see the pastor once a week. That's how we're able to do it. Um, you know, some of us listen to uh, things that we'd never let our kids listen to, watch things that we'd never let our kids watch. I don't know why they call them adult movies, almost as if somehow we've matured to be able to ingest sinful pleasure on TV when kids can't. How is it that we think we've matured to where we can digest sin? It's not possible. We can't do it. Uh, nor would we ever, you know, we, we would never tell uh, our kids some of the things. You know, sometimes it's good to tell your kids, look, these are mistakes that I made as a kid. My kids were disappointed to hear that I've actually... Uh, that I've actually taken in cigarettes before. My kids were, they were grieved to hear that I had taken a sip of alcohol. I'm ashamed to admit that I've actually done that. But I tell them, I wish I never had. Amen. But I tell them, you know, and, and the thing is, the fact is, is it wasn't long lasting. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a long period of time that I did this, but it was rebellion. And I told them, I said, it's not worth it. Right. It's not worth it at all. Right. Not even getting into it. Um, you know, honestly, when I, when, I, uh, when I first tried the bottle, I, I didn't get any kind of a blessing out of it, ever. <laughs> if there is such you know, you know what I'm talking about, all right? I never, that, that, that never helped me. Not even the first try helped me. Um, but they are invasive decisions. But here we have yet another invasive consequence of a bad decision to go into Egypt, all right? Some of you remind me that I'm too hard on the patriarchs, and I realize that I am, all right? And uh, the next time that you see them, tell them I apologize. <laughs> okay, all right. But their bad decisions are such great examples to our own actions that I have to use them. They're helpful so that we don't make the same mistake, all right? And I, you know, I have all respect to Abram, you know. I, 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 think, I think that's why we find their bad decisions in the Bible. Hindsight is 2020. And in order to keep you from a lot of problems, no pun intended, all right, um, you know, I, I'm going to share this lot story with you. Um, you know, in order to keep you out of Egypt, the world, I'm going to tell you about, a, about a, the bad decision that Abram made. Well, Pastor, you probably would have made that decision too, five times over. I assure you, I would have done it a lot worse than Abram. I, I don't consider myself any kind of an equal with Abram, but I'm using his story to help us. Uh, you know, I'm thankful that we have that decision recorded so that we can be sure not to make the same mistake. First of all, he shouldn't have taken Lot along. All right, I've made that clear based on God's instructions. But then Lot might not have chosen Sodom and Gomorrah as a campground. When Lot chose it, the Bible says that he saw, the, he saw that Sodom was well watered like the plains of Egypt. All right, so they went to Egypt too. But now we have another situation. All right, God just told Abram that he was going to make his seed as the stars of the heavens. As a husband, at least I think it's the proper thing to do. You ought to tell your wife everything that God shares with you. You ought to, you ought, you ought to tell her what God's doing in your heart if you're a husband. Um, you know, so I imagine Abram told Sarai, I think he said this, I was really planning on going back, Sarai, but I saw the word of the Lord in a vision and he made the most amazing covenant with me. He said things would not be easy, but I received the most clear vision of our legacy, you and me. God made it clear what we were supposed to do. When he said, get thee out, he looked at Sarai as one flesh with him. I can imagine Sarai being encouraged. Don't you think Sarai was encouraged? You know, she'd been waiting all this time and she's, she hears Abram say, God came through and he said, it's still gonna happen. I imagine she was encouraged and I can imagine that she felt like her husband had been renewed again and I think it's possible that she felt like after all this time that she was with child that very moment. Did God say that? No, he didn't say she was with child that moment, but he did make that promise. But I imagine she thought, well, I must be pregnant right now. But then a month goes by. Two months. Two years. Look at verse 3 uh, there in the middle. Ten years. And one day, Sarai sees a reflection 
sees her reflection in a bowl or something that she was working with and she realizes just how old she became. And I can imagine that she became disillusioned. She came up with an idea. Crazy idea. You know how you come up with an idea that's absurd and you look back on it and you're like, I don't know what in the world made me think of that. Have you ever done that? I've done it. I've, I've looked back at certain things that I almost decided to do and I thought, what was I thinking? I sure am glad my wife told me, you're dumb. <laughs> you know, because I would have made a mess of things. Oh, <clears throat> you know, but she looks at Hagar and she says, Hagar is young. Hagar. Hmm. She's my servant. She could bear a child for me. We look at this decision and we think, what a stupid idea. But the thing is, is she desperately wanted kids. Anything was a good idea for her at this time. And so she goes to Abram one day and tells him her idea. It's not a good idea, okay? A terrible idea, but she tells him her idea. And uh, can I just say, it really doesn't look like Abram disputes with her very much, does it? Doesn't look like he said, now, Sari, God is not going to leave you out. I know we're old, but I'm telling you, that promise was just as sure as I'm standing here for us. No, it just says that he hearkened. It means that he listened. But did you know that the word hearken in the Hebrew also means obey? And I don't know what Abram was thinking, and honestly, I don't know. I don't want to know what Abram was thinking at this particular time. This is one of those uncomfortable texts. Um, You know, I've thought of so many reasons, so many logistics behind his consent to this awful proposal, but I always come to this conclusion, he was a man. With the very same temptations, the very same struggles as any man, and he thought it was a good idea. Look, I'm going to tell you something. We keep keep sweeping sin under the rug and we're going we're gonna to see the infestation of pornographic addiction. We're going to see it just surmount in our churches. You know, this is one of those things, you know, well, we just don't talk about that kind of stuff in church. I mean, we don't talk about X-rated things in church. It's not X-rated. It's sin. Amen. That's what it is. And we need to talk about it because I'm telling you right now, there are young men that are everywhere, young women even, Older men, it doesn't matter really the age, but there are men who have problems and they're afraid to talk about it and they can't find freedom because they don't think anybody will listen to them. They think that they'll condemn them. We need to, con- we need to confront it and we need to do it in a loving manner. We need, to, we need to say, look, I'm open. I'm ready to help somebody. And look, we are all men. We struggle with it. That's the problem is because when we hear about it, we grimace because we go, oh, that's, that's terrible. But the, the problem is, is that's a struggle that we have as well. I'm not saying necessarily pornography, but I'm talking about lust. It affects us all, but it's a shameful sin. But we need to be able to confront it, though. Abram was a flesh and blood man, and here his wife comes up with a plan to have kids that internally would satiate a lust in a justifiable way. See, you know, what man wouldn't accept that for Abram and his idea, all right? One of the reasons that we have some of the issues that we have amongst Christians today is because, you know, there's not enough honesty behind the pulpit. See? But it it would yield invasive weeds that would become a terrible menace to the fruit of the womb that God intended. Sarah. See? This is for Sarah. The choice to sin yields invasive weeds. Invasive weeds that are hard to get rid of. You might not even know what uh, know that what you're doing is sinful. Have you ever, have you thought about that? Some of the things that you might be doing, you may not know are sinful. But here's the problem: they're still just as damning. This is why God forbids us to sin. He loves us too much to let us do something that's going to bring destruction to the life that He blessed us with. Hold your place here and turn with me to James chapter one, okay? James chapter one. I want to show you a verse that reveals what I'm talking about, and honestly. The way it is written, I honestly think that James was thinking of Abram's decision to consent to his wife's proposal. Look with me at um, verse 13 of chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, all right, you see how there's conception involved, it bringeth forth sin. So there wasn't sin yet, but when it conceives, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, doesn't bring forth life, it brings forth death, all right? I'm going to ask you something. If I gave you a cyanide pill, and I didn't tell you that it would kill you, and you bit into it, would it kill you? Yes, it would kill you. Whether I told you it was a cyanide pill, whether I told you it was poison or not, it's going to kill you. If I preach about sin or not, it's still going to kill you. And that's what it says here in James 1. Sin is sin. Death is death. And the one precedes the other, whether you know it or not. Abram might not have considered his actions sinful, but it would result in the deaths of millions of his promised seed throughout history. Ishmael, which is the child Hagar bore to Abram, is the father of the Arab nation. I'm reading this book about a thousand plus mistakes in the Quran. I cannot believe that these Muslims believe the way that they do and continue to see the mistakes that are in this thing, but they're taught this crazy way. It's similar to the JWs that you cannot, you, you can't base fact on your faith and all this garbage. And so they constantly refute it. But, you know, you ask any Arab, any Arab, excuse me. Any error? Ask him. Who is the father? Who is the chosen seed of Abraham? Every single, I shouldn't have said Arab, I should have said Muslim. Every single Muslim will say, Ishmael mm -hmm. is the chosen seed. Every single one of them. You ought to try it sometime. Just don't argue with them if they're holding an AK 47, okay? <laughs> but sin kills. All right? Uh, you know, it, doesn't it make more sense then for me to name sin? Those preachers that refuse to name sin are only looking out for themselves, I think, personally. Jesus was crucified because he manifested what would kill the nation of Israel. They didn't like what they were hearing, and so they crucified him. But he was naming to them what would kill them, and so they killed him instead. It doesn't make sense, but neither does our stupid decisions. And neither does God's love for us in spite of it. That doesn't make sense either, but he does. He loves us. So, of course, Sarai's plan is not going, to, is not going as Sarah had, had hoped. And often fulfilling the Lord's will in our own efforts is just as empty as this. We often attempt to live a pure life in our own strength, to love the Lord in our own strength, to go soul winning in our own ability, yet the ending result is that we have to keep filling this egocentric bubble with air while the air continues to escape. It's hard work keeping our ego puffed up. Because the air continues to escape. Instead of, instead of becoming inflated, you need to be filled instead. That's what we need. It's a labor that God never expected of us. Often the church leaders feel that the Holy Spirit needs help to keep a congregation in line. Which is the hybrid law approach that John Van Gelden was talking about. You really should read that book. If you're a Christian, you need to read The Liberating Life of Christ. So they devise rules and guidelines that keep everyone in line instead of teaching them that we are all led by one spirit. And he might lead me to do things differently. He, the one spirit, might lead me to do things differently than you. He's that powerful and he's that in control, but we don't trust him enough. And so we choose, we, we opt out of his powerful control for our little minuscule rules. It's It's crazy. Uh, and so the end result in church is the bitter eye, the resentful, the disillusioned, the dissatisfied saint of God. Sarah says something very interesting here that we should take note of. Look at Genesis 16 and verse 5, okay? And Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> right? Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Now, think about this. I don't know how many of you have ever wondered why she was blaming him. This was her idea in the first place, right? Um, but she says, I've given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived 
I, your wife, was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, behold, uh, uh, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. We have a really serious mess on our hands here in this passage of Scripture. It's terrible. Do you see how invasive Abram's decisions are becoming? It's literally like kudzu. I think everybody knows what kudzu is, right? Right? No, that's not it. You got the wrong one, buddy. Yeah, there we go. There's, I, I'm, I got a whole bunch of illustrations on here for the kudzu. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I think everybody pretty much knows where it is. If you've traveled at all, you have. Um, you know, you've seen it on highways while you're traveling. It's invasive. It just grows over everything. Um, uh, it was brought to America as a means to prevent erosion, I think, but the stuff spread like wildfire. So you have power poles and power lines covered with the stuff in certain areas. But we see this girl, Hagar, taken from Egypt. And you think about that. Have he not decided to go to Egypt? It's possible this might not have ever happened. Now Sarai is saying, this is all your fault. She's pointing at Abram, all right? Was it all his fault? Yes. What? <laughs> yes, it was his fault. You know why? Because he should have immediately said, Sarai, you are crazy. That's what he should have said. She said, I have an idea. Hagar, you can take her. She'll be my, she'll, you know what her idea was? If you read it carefully, she said, I'm going to sit on top of Hagar. And so when she has the baby, it'll look like I'm having a baby. What is wrong with her? See what I'm saying? Basically, I want to use her as an incubator. She should have said, Sarah, you're nuts. God promised. I believe him. That's it. Period. I know that things are crazy, but God told me. He didn't have to go along with this. All right? It says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. There was no worries here. This means that Sarai was with Abram no matter what. Even if she disagreed, she was still with him. Abram wasn't afraid that Sarai was going to leave him. That's not what this was about. There was nothing that Abram had to lose by saying, You are crazy, Sarai. There was nothing. No, I believe it was his own lusts that prompted him to agree with her. Uh, General McAuliffe, during the uh, Battle of the Bulge, was given a note from the Germans that said, uh, We want your complete and total surrender now. And he wrote on that piece of paper one word, nuts, and sent it back. <laughs> you know what? They were winning. These, these Nazis were trying to convince them they weren't. Look, the Bible says that we're to fight from victory, not to victory. From victory to victory. That's how it says it, right? From to victory all the time. We have to keep ourselves in check moment by moment. What we say, what we look at. Listen to, we need to ask ourselves, where is this going to lead me? And the, 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 the wrong path starts when you really didn't even realize that you were making a wrong decision. You really need to analyze where you're going in your life right now. Where is this going to lead me? We ask ourselves, is this movie worth, uh, you know, we need to ask ourselves, is this, worth, is this movie worth corrupting the minds of my kids over? Is, uh, you know, is how I talk about people at home going to engender a love for the church in the hearts of my kids? I'm just using a family as an example here. You know, there are little ears that are listening, and you might say, well, I don't have any kids, and you might not. But this is your church, and the selfish complaining that you allow to escape from your mouth, or the bitter look that you might give people, or even not coming to church when you don't feel like it, causes these kids to ask questions. Make no mistake, when you aren't at church, these kids want to know why. They come to me. Rachel comes to me more than any other kid and says, where is so-and-so? How come they're not here? And I have to tell her I'm not exactly sure, but I know they've got good reasons for it. I don't know what to tell them sometimes. But we need to make sure that we're an example to them. When you're not there, they notice. And there are times when they wonder, well, why do I have to go to church? If brother or sister so-and-so doesn't go to church, I don't see why I don't. Do you know why they think that way? It's because they look up to you. That's why they admire you. You say, well, who would admire me? These kids do. 
Every person, these kids have, have gone around the, around the uh, room. You know, it's a sad situation that we live in, in this, that we have in this story because children are involved. Ishmael, he suffered. And generation after generation has suffered because of a stupid decision. Stupid, stupid decision. I know that's a bad word for kids, right? But th- what a dumb decision that they made. Um, but there's a verse in Joel chapter 2 that I want us to look at this morning, okay? All right, we're still on time here, all right? Would you turn there? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Right, Ezekiel's a pretty big book, so you can start there. And Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and turn to chapter 2. Now we're going to get to some good stuff, all right? Let's look down at verse 25, chapter 2. And I will, what does it say? Restore Restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. And I I want you to just look at what it says, but I'm going to kind of add some words here to help you understand exactly what he's saying. And what's left over by the locusts, what the canker worm ate, and what's left over by the canker worm, the caterpillar, and what's left over by the caterpillar, the palmer worm. My great army. So basically, the person who's lost everything. I'm going to restore that. I'm going to restore what you've lost. All right? Uh, My great army, which I sent among you. That's a promise, but you need to look at the context, though. Here's context, Brother Mark Scott, right? Um, uh, Let's look at verse 12. Therefore also now said the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. <laughs> Joel, uh, or Jonah called him that, you know. He forgave the Ninevites when they turned. Mm-hmm. Who, know, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? I can say that we know that he will. Mm-hmm. We know that he will. He promised the key. The key to re- recovering from a life of bad decisions is to say, God, I messed up. And be specific. Do you know there are people who to this day refuse to say, I messed up. And God just, God says, I'm not helping you until you recognize you messed up. You got to be specific about it. Don't just say I messed up, but just start, you know, name what you know you've messed up and be honest with him. Let him know how you messed up. He knows already. Right? He knows already. He wants you to come to him and talk to him about it. Your past, your past, you know, the things that you've done, they have consequences. They have consequences. Your past might have involved sins that you might not have known were sins at the time, but you know now. And you say, well, I didn't know that that was sin back then. Still tell him, I messed up. It hurt me. And those sins might have devastated you. They might have devastated your life. For some of us in this room, our past is what's hindering us from revival, holding on to that past. We're not willing to look forward. You know, I love love, uh, Harold Vaughn. He calls his retreats, he calls them the prayer advance. He said, I don't like the word retreat. We're not in retreat. We're advancing. (laughs) So he he doesn't call it retreats. He calls it an advance. I love that. But, you know, our past is what's hindering us from revival. Some of us might have, we might have been the Hagar in the situation. Did Hagar have a choice? Not really. She was a servant. We might have been Hagar, but Hagar still suffered consequences from her actions. As I've already said, sin is sin. Just as poison is poison. She might not have been sinful, but her actions, even though she might not have even had a choice, it was still poison, see? Somebody might force you to take cyanide, it's still going to kill you. They kill them. Bitterness over a past filled with defeat and destitution will do nothing for you. Anger toward people who have ruined your life will do nothing to fix the situation. As, much, as hard as it is to deal with, it will never. And you might say, well, Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. I don't know what you've been through, but I can tell you anger and bitterness will not fix it. Right. Some of us are trying to win our kids after a life of bad choices. I'm going to tell you something. You can't fix what's been done. You. America is still fighting that kudzu. 
They can't get rid of it. It's invasive. Your past is going to snowball and new problems will be added to the old unless you humble yourself. Look at the first thing God said to Hagar, all right? Hagar felt used, used and abused. Verse 9 of our text here, okay? She felt used and abused. She felt used up. How do you think she felt, really? She was young. She was beautiful. And she was used. But look at the instructions that the angel of the Lord gives her. Verse 9 of our text, all right? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. That's a hard thing to do after what they did to me. You see what I'm saying? When the world, Hagar was out here in the wilderness because of Sarai. What do you mean go back and submit to her? And now God is telling her to go back. Submit. But you know what? That's humility. I want you to submit to her. She's chosen. She's chosen. I made a promise to them. You submit to them. And I promise you things are going to go well for you. Oh. Oh. Think about Hagar. Her life began in slavery. She was used as an incubator. She was abused. She felt useless. Her youth was robbed by these untrusting Christians. Right? And really that's what happens in the flesh-filled church. In the flesh-filled church, you know, uh, the, the pastor, leaders, they'll, they'll come pat you on the back and encourage you because you're doing something for them. But the moment that you can't do anything for them, they start treating you, ignoring you, not doing anything for you, things like that, all right? That's a flesh-filled church. Any motives of aiding others are for selfish gain. The flesh can be nothing more than this because you're constantly having to inflate that pride, see? But Hagar was a servant, a slave, and God gave her these strange instructions. But then look at the very next verse, verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Did this seem unlikely? Not at all, really. You think about this. She was pregnant. She's already pregnant. She hears this angel say, I will multiply thy seed to where it cannot be even counted. She could have just said, well, I don't, I don't even see why I should return to Sarai. I'm already pregnant. I've already got my nation in the womb. I don't see why. Second part sounds pretty promising. Right now, I don't think I need to humble myself. I can't see how this will happen if I go back. It didn't really seem that way, did it? It seemed like if she kept wandering around the wilderness, that it'd be more likely that she could produce a nation, not go back as a slave again. But God told her to do it. And you know what? She humbled herself. And I don't care what arguments there are. I realize that Ishmael is a result of a barbaric, lawless group of insurrectionists that stir up trouble no matter where they go. <laughs> they really are, all right? That's, that's, that's where they come from. But she still humbled herself right here. She obeyed nonetheless. This is humility. Admit to God where you messed up, even if at the time you didn't know better. Admit you messed up. Are you out in the wilderness? Are you thirsting for something better? Are you feeling used up, chewed up, and spit out? Humble yourself. All right, now we can look at James 4.10 up here. All right, there we go. All right, so James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he, not you, not the church, the pastor, your friends, he shall lift you up. Yeah. 1 Peter 5.6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, in his timing, You've got to stop. You've got to stop trying to make things work out for yourself. Turn to Him. You've got to look to Him for help, not to yourself. He'll make the remaining years that you have left count big time. Because He's God. Abram, when, by the time he had Isaac, he was 99 years old. But look at the legacy that he was still able to leave behind. Incredible. Only God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Really, you think about it. Everything you've lost, only God can do that. Job got all of his family restored. Maybe not the same kids, of course. But God still gave it all back. But if you ever expect him to do that, you must come to him and say, Lord, I. See, sometimes we blame him for our bad choices. And we blame him for the invasive results. How could you have allowed? 
this? Why couldn't you have given me a life like theirs? I, I've asked that question at times. Uh, there are certain dreams that I've had that I've not ever seen fulfilled. Maybe my life's not been as hard as some of yours, but there's been disappointments in my life, and I've asked why. Sometimes we say, Lord, this is not my fault, but I have to suffer for it. But that's not going to work. The invasive negativity that is choking away your life can only be cleared away by God himself. It's the only way that we can do that. But you must turn to him in order for him to do it. It's saying there's nothing that I can do about it. I messed up and there's nothing I can do to fix it. Lord, I did it. I, I have messed up and you are the only one that's able to help me. I'm going to tell you something about that. He can't help himself when it comes to helping somebody who humbles himself. Look at Ahab. It says that Ahab humbled himself greatly before the Lord. And the Lord had mercy, didn't he? He can't help himself when somebody actually humbles himself and says, I've made this mess and I'm in it and I can't do anything about it, but you can help me, Lord. Sorry about this. I'm sorry I messed up. I'm sorry I made these decisions. Some of them I might not have been able to, but I realized that the things I was involved in, the things that happened in my life, they've wrecked my life and I need you to help me because I can't do it. <laughs> Next week we'll look at, this, at the name Hagar gave to God. It's the very first time in the Bible that someone gave a name to God. Isn't that interesting? It's the first time anybody ever named him. Thou God seest me. Thou Roi. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder if there's... I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for watching this broadcast. If you have any questions about the message or would like to chat in any way, we would love to connect with you. You can message us on Messenger and we will get you in touch with the right people. I also want to invite you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ personally. To make Jesus your own personal Savior. Friend, if this message has helped you understand the gospel, that you cannot earn your way to heaven, that there is no way to achieve your salvation. If you've understood today that salvation is a gift from God, and all you can do is receive it by faith, then why don't you act on the promise of God? Why don't you claim the truth that Jesus Christ himself said that whosoever would believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life? Wherever you may be right now, I hope that you will bow your head and heart before God and place your faith in Jesus Christ. Tell him that you want him to be your personal savior. He will come into your life. He'll be a savior, a father, and a faithful friend He'll change you beginning today. To find out more about this decision, I encourage you to message us or go to the link below me, bit.ly slash pandemic323 to learn more. And I want to thank you again so much for taking part in this broadcast, and I hope to see you next time.